Turn your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. We're there in, in verse 1. And the title of the sermon this afternoon is God's Hierarchy. God's Hierarchy. And it's found in uh, the, the verses that I'll be using for the message, or the start of it at least, will be 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, uh, going down to verse 3. And it says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am I of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinance, ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of, er, of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. And so the reason that I chose this title today is, you know, one of the things that uh, I, I've kind of just been, uh, I don't know, maybe changing the approach or just the way that I've been structuring uh, some of the sermons is that it, it's not common to people. I don't believe that people are born with an innate uh, wanting to improve themselves. I think that that's something that taught, you know, a long time ago I was, uh, I was taught that leadership is, you're not born a leader, leaders are made. But also another thing that, that you see in life is that people who are constantly learning or growing, that's something that you also have to make a conscious choice uh, to do as well. And so one of the things that I often catch myself in is when you're doing, uh, when you're trying to learn more or when you're trying to grow, well, you tend to surround yourself with people who are better than yourself. And so you, you tend to surround yourself with individuals or try to associate with people that know uh, more than you or at least know the same information but are willing to learn and are looking to improve themselves. And so sometimes you neglect the fact that the people that you know, maybe are following you or are listening to the messages that you're bringing, they don't know as much as you do or they're here to learn on the Word of God. And so sometimes you're neglecting uh, teaching some of the basic doctrines of the Bible because you're trying to catch up with the people that you're learning from and you're trying to teach what they're, they're learning or they're teaching you. And the reality is that, uh, you know, we have to cover everything in the, in the Word of God. And, and I don't know if you guys have caught on to the theme for this month, but it's just doing a lot of the basic doctrines, a lot of the basic belief systems that we have. And one of the things that, that uh, I think is real important for us as, as a society, especially as Christians, is to understand God's hierarchy. In, in our lives and in our church lives and why we do the certain things that we do. And so this is going to be more of a message of just what the Bible teaches us that is God's hierarchy. You say, why would you even uh, you know, preach on something like that? Well, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that God likes to do things decently and in order. And so if God has an order of things, then we should find out what that order is so that we know how to live our lives according to that order. And one of the things that I'm not going to uh, emphasize in my points today that much, and, and, I, and I'll explain when I get to that point, but I'm not really going to go through the government part of God's hierarchy because I think if you understand the other parts that we're going to talk about, then you'll fall in, you'll know how to deal with a government, whether it's righteous or not. You know, because I think if you, if you follow God's hierarchy, if God is your ultimate authority on all matters of life and faith, then you'll know how to address the things that you're dealing with with your family, with your church, with even the government that you're serving. Here in the U.S., obviously, we have, it's the U.S. government. You know, that's a given, but in, in case uh, anybody didn't know, that's, that's you know, we belong in the U.S., so that's the government that, that, we, that we follow. But the first thing that we want to look at, if you'll turn, and, uh, if you'll turn to John 16, what I'm going to read for you, Mark, is that we see that in the Trinity, we have, you know, 1 John 5, 7 tells us, you know, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Word, I mean the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So we know that there is a, a trinity. There's three persons that make up one God. And we also believe that there, uh, you know, I've read a, a lot of uh, doctrinal statements where they're co-equal in power. But the one thing that I don't see emphasized a lot is that, is that hierarchy that we see in the Bible. You know, even Jesus talks about he's not doing his will, but the Father's will. That means that the Father sent him, and then we see that he leaves as a comforter. So we see that in the, in, it starts with God, right? Obviously, God is the ultimate source of all authority, all hierarchy. But even within the Trinity, there seems to be a hierarchy of the way things are executed. You know, you see God the Father sent Jesus. You know, he's the one that raised him up from the dead. And then we see there uh, in Mark 14, verse 36, speaking of Jesus, it says, And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, nevertheless, not what I will, 
but what thou wilt. And so we see that in the Trinity, in this one accord, Jesus looks to the Father and he's doing the Father's will. He's not doing his will and he leaves that example to us of how we need to die to self. Then if you're, you're there in John 16, verse 13, and we see how, it, how we also in, incorporate the Holy Ghost. We see there, uh, how be it, in verse 13, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come. And if you see that word there, Spirit, is capitalized as speaking of the Holy Spirit. He will guide you in all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me. Who's that me? That's Jesus Christ that's speaking here, right? He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. So we see this exchange of information is following a chain of command. And, and you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit's not speaking of himself, but he's speaking of Jesus. And Jesus is doing it because he's doing it of the will of the Father. We see here in John 14, uh, just a few pages uh, before, in verse 26, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things. So who sent it? The Father, in whose name? In Jesus' name, he's sending the Comforter. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So the Holy Ghost speaks to us of what things? Of the things that God, the, the Son, I mean, Jesus Christ, God the Son left us, which is God's Word. So we see that there's this, this hierarchy. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, you know, I mean, growing up, especially here in the U.S., you, you know, people have that tendency, like, I, I built myself up from my own bootstraps. Nobody tells me what to do. You know, I make my own decisions. But the reality is that, you know, even before I got saved, I remember I got to a point in my life, I was maybe a young man, 22, 23. I couldn't have been more than 25 because I wasn't saved. And I remember telling my dad, I was like, man, dad, you know, one of the things that's really tough for, for a young adult to swallow as he, as he goes out into the workforce is you realize that, even though you're out of your parents' authority, you always have to answer to somebody. There's always somebody you're going to answer to. It doesn't matter how independent, how big of a business you have. People are like, oh, I own my own business. I'm my own boss. Nobody tells me what to do. Well, just try not paying your taxes and see how that goes, you know? Or try not to, you know, follow some permits and we'll see how that... You answer to somebody all the time. So then in the, in the, in the course of our daily actions... If we're going to answer to people, if we have an accountability to not only ourselves but individuals, how should we make those decisions of whom we answer to? You know, do I, uh, how do I make the decision of whether I'm going to pay my taxes or not, or whether I'm going to file that permit or not, or whether I'm going to honor my father and mother or not? Well, we look to the Word of God. And the very first thing that we see in God's hierarchy is that there is a hierarchy in the Trinity. I, I'm not saying here that, you know, I don't, by the way, I'm not, the Bible tells us that it's too great for us to understand. I'm just extrapolating for what's from the Bible. We see that there's at least a chain of command when it comes to information. You know, God, the, Jesus Christ, did the Father's will. The Holy Spirit is going to teach us or bring to remembrance things that Jesus Christ left us, which is his word. So at least on that point, we can all agree. And I'm not, this is not a Trinity message. So there's a lot more verses and things that we could go into. But we see that that establishes that point. And then when we move into our Christian walk, then we start to see how do we fall in line with the different things that God has left us. So the, the first thing that we want to look at is that God left us independent churches. And the word churches, plural, is used at least 37 times in the Bible. You know, because there is this thing, uh, this belief system that, you know, people get saved by the church or that there's this universal church. We're going to see this movement. And even though Jesus Christ established the church, you know, and I believe that one day we will all serve in a church in heaven, he left us independent churches here. Because what our church does here has no bearing on what, you know, and I'm going to use a church that, that we are like-minded with here in Houston, has no bearing on what Pure Words does. I mean, we might team up with Pure Words Baptist Church down in, in uh, South Houston, but we run our church the way we run it, and they run their church the way they run it. We might do something similar. We might, oh, that's a good idea. Let's implement it in our church. But it's not, uh, we're not in a, a denomination. And we see that biblically. And why is that important? Well, because we don't have independent churches, then we don't have independent thought from the Bible. 
And then that's how we're going to fall into these false doctrines. You know, uh, the biggest the biggest culprit of this that I can think of is obviously the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church says that it's through the church that one gets saved, right? It's through the church and the Pope. But go to, uh, if you guys will be in Romans 16, but I'm going to read for you in Colossians 1, verse 15. What does the Bible tell us, tell us about churches? And by the way, we're not going to, these each one of these can be its own sermon. So I'm just going to take some verses from each one of these points, and then we'll tie it all together. But Colossians 1, verse 15 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him, this is speaking of Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. Now you say, oh, well, there, you just said the church. Well, you know, I, I'm, this is talking in a spiritual sense. You know, Jesus Christ is the head of the church. We all belong to, you know, that congregation when we meet him in heaven. Because the church, what is a church? It's just a congregation of believers. It's not this building or that building. By the way, you know, Trey and I, before we went so when we looked at that, and we were like, man, that's that Hispanic building I was talking about that's, you know, just like two blocks down here. They, uh, they took that aluminum, uh, and uh, what they did is they're putting styrofoam on the outside, and then they put a wire mesh, and then they, they're just basically coating it with... Uh, with concrete, so that's a that's a good way to save some money. It's a good idea, you know. We're not gonna, they're Pentecostal, by the way. I, I'm almost sure of it, um, but uh, we might take that idea if we ever build a building because it's just a more efficient, cost-effective way of doing it. So see, we can get some good ideas from uh, these false religions, just how to build, you know, the building, not the church. But if you go to Romans 16 verse 4, it says, "Who have for my life laid down their own necks." unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Verse 16 tells us, Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. And then verse seven, uh, 1 Corinthians 7.17 tells us, But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk, and so I in all churches. And so ordain I in all churches. Sorry about that. And so ordain I in all churches. And so we see here several examples of Paul making reference to what? The churches. You know, and we know that because obviously we have also the epistles, right? We have Colossians, because he's writing to the church in, Col uh, in uh, and excuse me for butchering that, but in Colossia and the, the Ephesians. And then we, and then even in the Revelation, we have Philadelphia and we have the, you know, the different churches of Thessalonica and all the, all the different churches that are referenced. These were independent churches, and they had their own issues. As a matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, what the, the, the chapter we're referencing, I'm, we're not going to go through that. I'm just talking about the first three uh, verses. But if we were to read later on, you know, Paul admonishes them for not, uh, not uh, doing the Lord's Supper correctly, not executing the Lord's Supper correctly, and he, and he gives them strong word. He's talking to who? The church at Corinth. He's talking to the Corinthians there. You know, later on he talks to uh, the in to the Galatians. He's like, "How you you so quickly forgotten the gospel that you believed?" You know, and he he remember he reminds them of how quickly they're they're just led astray. So why is this? I mean, I believe this is because it's just like our families. Every family is different. So every church family is different. We have a different set of issues and problems that we need to address biblically than you know, the church down south or a church in another state or a church in another country. You know, Pastor uh, Cobb brought a, a message today about, you know, just the sodomite infestation. Even though that's a general problem, you know what? It's also an infestation here in our, in our, in our city. In Houston, you know, we've actually had a lesbian mayor. You know, it's, it's very specific to our city because we, we actually have a whole section called Montrose where there's, you know, a whole community of these filthy perverts and they paint their their flags and they're telling everybody that they should as a matter of fact let's not even go that far just over there on work by the trini mendahal uh community center there's that church right next to it that you know wants to welcome everybody in so you know you speak specifically to the issues at hand so god establishes you know obviously god the father the son the holy ghost then we have the church well why would you even bring that up because God also gives us a lot of instruction. We're not going to go through that about how we need to act in church, 
the authority the church has in our lives. So, for example, Pastor Cobb has authority in our lives to admonish, to teach, to lead. That doesn't mean he has the authority to go into my family, in my house, and tell me what to do. But he does have the authority to tell me what to do in church to an extent. And regardless of whether he's going to tell me or not, he has the authority from God, just like I have the authority to tell you what God says about your life and about the church life and about the way we should, we should do these things. You know, as a matter of fact, what did, what did Pastor say this, uh, this morning? He said, look, I know this was a tough message and it might offend you, but these are not my words. This is not my opinion. This is God's word. It's not God's opinion. This is the truth coming from God's word. So a true church, and I'm talking singular, or churches in the area, are those that follow God's hierarchy. You know, that they understand that the head of that church is who? Christ. See, even though Pastor Cobb has that authority, and I serve under him, and if Pastor Cobb was missing, I would have that authority. It's the authority through Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, you know, if I went against God, just like Pastor Cobb said this morning, if he went against God, you know who, who, who has veto power? God does. You know, and, and what's interesting is the more that uh, the group of circle I run in, you know, as far as there's two types of, pe- uh, of circles, I guess, I run in. One is the individuals that I surround myself with that I'm trying to uh, learn from. These are individuals that I, that I look for encouragement. You know, whether, when I come here to church, I, I want to hear a good message from Pastor Cobb. I mean, today's message was great. Um, but then also, you know, as we're leading and, and we're going out there and, and executing the, the, the uh, office of the pastor, well, these are people that are coming to us that need to have questions and they want to learn. And, you know, what, it's the conversations in the last few weeks that I've had with certain individuals that just made me realize, you know, there's a lot of people that don't have that base or that knowledge that some other individuals in church might have. You know, I mean, they, they, they I had a question last night that by a 52-year-old man who did not know that people lived for 800, 600, 900 years. He just started reading Genesis for the first time. You know, and, we, and I take that for granted. We take that for granted that have grown up, you know, in church or been saved for some time that we have read our Bibles or at least heard enough Bible to know these things. And, and it's not, I don't, I'm not even looking down upon them. It's, it, to me, it was encouraging that someone wants to come up and learn what the Bible says so that he can improve his life and his family's life. Now, the next thing that we see is that we know God established the church, he established the government, and he established the f- family. The reason that I'm not really going into, and we know I could have gone to Romans 13 and different verses, I mean uh, sections in, in Scripture about that, is because if we establish the foundation on how we are going to respect and follow the rules in church, if we establish our foundation on how we understand the Trinity and its hierarchy, if we establish the foundation of how we, the hierarchy and the home works, well then how you deal with the rules of government is, is, is probably the easiest one. You'll know what rules to obey and what rules not to obey. And what I mean by that is there's really only one rule, or I guess a set of rules. Any rule that obeys God, that disobeys God's word directly, morally, in a strong sense, it's going to cause you to, to sin against God directly, I would say that that's a, maybe one that you're not going to follow. So, you know, if, I'll give you a good example so you don't think that I'm trying to cause a mutiny because that's not... The idea of this is actually to have you follow God's rules and be in subjection to the powers... But if, if right now somebody came in and said, by city ordinance of Houston, churches are no longer allowed to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you know what we would do in this church? We would still pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And they said, well, you're going to get fines, and if you, eventually you might even go to jail. Well, then you know what? Find me until you need to take me to jail. That's why the hierarchy is so important, because you need to know. But if you know they came in and said, look, you need to extend your building out by one foot because City Orange says that this building needs to be 25 feet instead of 20 feet. I mean, I don't know. We might try to look for another building or expand it out, but that's not a, we're not going to diso- we're going to try to obey that to the best of our ability. You know, that's not a, it, no, nobody's going to go to hell. We're not going to directly, we're going to try to do our best to follow. I mean, as a matter of fact, we have permits. As you come in, you have the city permits, uh, occupancy permits, and we have permits for light, all this stuff. So by the way, so just make that clear. We are following the rules, but we're not going to follow rules that make us go against God's word. That's a very specific thing. Now, when it comes to family, God has a hierarchy there too. You know, he said, Jesus is the head of the church, right? And in the church, we have certain rules. But when people come to church, there's family entities. 
And those entities, or those units, better said, those units, so people don't take it out of context, is you have man, woman, and child, or children, right? And that hierarchy is man, women, and children. And you know, you say, this seems like a really simple message, but the reality is in today's uh, age, it's amazing why God talked about it so much. Because there's so much confusion about who should lead and what role should they take. And so if you'll turn over to Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, and uh, we'll take a look there in Ephesians 5, and then um, and we'll read some of these verses. Ephesians 5, uh, verse 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So we see that there's, a, there's an order of things. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Then it, then it gives instruction to the husband. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to ha love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as, as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, in today's society, that's actually kind of a, a, a very controversial set of verses. Women, there's a feminist movement out there. There's an attack on women that says that women should not be in subjection. You know, if you go to Hispanic countries, my mom tells me all the time, I love my mom. She's saved by grace. But, you know, she tells me that because I read this stuff, you know, and everybody grows differently. I'm not, I'm not, uh, by the way, I'm not, uh, my mom's had a great moral upbringing for me. She's taught me right in the ways. But one of the things that she doesn't like, but that she just kind of blankets the statement is whenever I say that a man leads to lead in the house, she, she accuses me of being a machismo, you know, a macho. She says, you have so much machismo in your in your attitude, in your character. You're just like your dad. You're such a macho. And I'm like, well, hold on a second. Because in Mexico, machos have a really bad reputation. You know, they're, they're kind of like, they just come in. They're like, woman, cook for me. Woman, you know, do everything for me and, and no love. But the Bible's telling me here that I must love my wife. You know, she's going to reverence me because I'm taking lead because that's what she wants me to do. You know, at the end of the day, have you ever asked a woman what she wants to go eat for dinner? I, I'd just rather say we're going to go eat dinner somewhere. Because, and it's not, I'm not picking up. That's just women like to think things through. They like to talk it out. They want to weigh all the options. And, you know, maybe in some environments that's fine, you know, at the home and certain. But when you're trying to make decisions, you know, in church or in business or in life, you know, guys don't have patience for that. They just want to make a decision and move on. And so, you know, it's easier. By the way, that's a good advice for any young, you know, people that are, they're looking to get married or are near their marriage, don't ask your wife where she wants to go to dinner. Just take her to dinner. If you lead her, she'll find something to eat at that restaurant, by the way. This is you know, a, a point. But go over to 1 Corinthians 7, and, and all the verses here are going to be talking about the family. I mean, obviously, I'm, I've already established that the hierarchy is the husband, the wife, and, and then the children. But I'm going to give you good scripture behind it. But you go to 1 Corinthians 7 while I read for you 1 Timothy 2. Uh, verse 9, it says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first born, formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. And so we see here a couple of things that are really important 
in a marriage. You know, I've met, because that's another bad sign of a macho, which is, that's how you know I'm not. You know, machos are not only, like, very uh, 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 oppressive and, you know, they just don't treat their women well, but they also are very proud of a good-looking woman, and they kind of parade her around for everybody to see. I don't want anybody looking at my wife. I love my wife, and I love that she dresses, you know, in a, in a chaste way, because the woman's not supposed to call attention to, you know, for anybody else. And today, nowadays, we, we have a problem with the way even women dress. You know, I tell my wife, it's hard for, for a man nowadays to go anywhere. You have to keep your head down because women just dress like basically, they just like not wearing any clothes. What do you, and then you're like, Pastor, what do you mean women wear clothes? Yeah, but when the clothes are so tight that it looks like you're not wearing clothes, you might as well just not be wearing any clothes. And I'm not uh, condoning, I'm not saying that that's what we should do. I'm just saying that's the problem with society today. And the problem is that you say, why is there so much divorce? Why is there so much adultery? Why is there so much fornication? Well, because women aren't shamefaced. You know, they're not chaste in, in their in their approach of life, whether they're single or they're at home. Because you know, if you, if they're single, they're in subjection to their father or mother. But if they're uh, in in marriage, they're in subjection to their husbands. You say, man, I don't know if I like this sermon because I like being an independent woman. Well, that's the problem. But God said there's nothing independent about what you're doing because God is is supposed to lead. And if you're following God then you're going to follow God's word. You know what I mean? That, that, that's the challenge. If we, read, if we keep reading on, it says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Why was she deceived? Because she wasn't around when her, with her husband when, when she was uh, talking to the serpent. You know, women are emotional. And I'm not, there's actually absolutely nothing negative about that statement. That's the way God made them. But because they're emotional, you know what's another word for Emotional gullible you know a woman can be gullible in the wrong environment that doesn't make them dumb it's just that emotions can make you do some really dumb things and then when you look in hindsight when when the emotions removed you realize that you would have not done that under those circumstances that's why in the military they train they train you and train you and train you so you don't panic in the mo in the heat of the moment because if you're emotional you might break down and not do anything. You could get yourself or somebody else killed. Well, it's the same thing in the home. A woman can get emotional to where they can get in trouble if, you know, if they're hanging around the wrong type of crowd or they're talking to the wrong individuals. And I'm not just talking about they're talking to other men. You know, sometimes women get together with other women, and if they're not in the right environment, they just influence each other incorrectly. You know, it's real easy to point out all the negative things about your husband. You know, it's kind of hard to point out all the positive things about them. And you get it, you ever seen this group of, you know, women get around together and all of a sudden, you know, you hear these issues come back and they're like, well, my wife went and she, she says that her husband does this and that. And I don't do this for her just like that other husband. Well, you're not that husband. You're this husband. You know, I mean, I'm not going to do the same things that, that Trey does to his wife. He's not, he loves on his wife different than I love my wife. I mean, that's just the way it is, right? But if my wife's in subjection to me, then it's my duty to love her correctly, and it's her duty to, to love me the way that God has told her, which is in complete subjection. What does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, in my mistakes, we're going to work it out, but in, in my strength, she's going to appreciate that. Then you, you're thankful for the good stuff, and you work on the negative stuff. Because let me tell you, being married, there's going to be some negative times. I mean, that's just the way it goes. If uh, you're in 1 Corinthians 7, but let me read 1 Corinthians 14, 34 real quick. It says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Let me just make a point here. You know, people love to tout this verse just against women. Look, I'm, this is actually not against women. This is biblical. Women shouldn't speak in the church and shouldn't teach in the church. That's why we don't believe in women preachers. But what's the next part of that verse? It says, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Look, if you're a man, it's time to man up and learn your Bible so that you can actually teach your family. You say, well, I'm not a good teacher. Well, at least learn to just teach your family. Nobody's asking you to teach a congregation. That's, those are the requirements for a bishop apt to teach. If you're called to do that or if you feel like you're led to, to be a preacher or anything like that, well, then that's your duty to learn the whole counsel of God. But you can at least learn the basics and teach your wife. I mean, if you married your wife, you have enough confidence around her to be able to teach her. 
because you had enough guts, guts to ask, ask her out and court her and win her over. I don't care how introvert you are. If you have that wife, you at least were extrovert enough to talk to that woman, right? Yeah, I, I'm not asking you to speak in a room of thousands of people. You can go home and in the privacy of your own home, you can talk to your wife and children about God. It's not that difficult. You know, you, that, that, that room should be as comfortable as any other room, right? I'm not asking you to be like a public speaker or anything here. But you're there in 1 Corinthians 7, and then we'll be in 1 Peter. But it says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 1, it says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication, fornication let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, one the other, except it be for consent, it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. And so we see here a strong admonishment for number one, don't touch a woman because you're gonna burn. And we, we could have gone to Proverbs, and I could just give you proverb uh, verse after verse about the, you know, the whorish woman, the, the scandalous woman, the, the woman that on the street, the woman that just, she's going to lure you in. You know, the Bible gives reference to that. But then it says, look, you don't have power over your own body, and she didn't have power in yours. And to, nowadays, you know, you go to these psychology, uh, these guys that they're doing uh, counseling, these worldly counselors, and they want to give power to both sides but that's not the way it is there's a hierarchy and if you notice another another theme that we see here is that God's plan is not for you to be single and and I guess I could have put those verses in there Paul I mean Paul says look if you can do like I do do it but most people that's the exception to the rule the reality is most people will look for a wife and most women will look for a husband and God God's plan for us is to be married and to raise children, and to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. They're not talking, hey, uh, as a matter of fact, there's not a lot of instruction in the Bible for single people other than to find a good wife and to get married and to you know, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. There's very few exceptions, and those instructions are specific, you know, the, the eunuchs and people like that. Are there people that aren't going to get married and are going to be full force for, for the Lord? There will be. But that's really an exception. I mean, the reality is most people need to be married and to be with their own wives. Because it's going to distract you from doing the things that, that you're going to do. You know, uh, go to Colossians 3, and I'll read for you First Peter. Um, and it says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. First Peter 3, verse 1, I'm sorry, I'm reading, but you're in Colossians. I'm just going to read this real quick. That if any obey not the word, they also may be without the word, with, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be hidden, man of heart, but let it be hid, let it, but let it be the hidden man of heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs, together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered i mean this is a, if you notice the theme here the bible speaks a lot about this hierarchy and, and honestly if we could get this right we could get a lot of things right you know that's why i decided not to talk about specifically the government because honestly if your wife is in subjection to you following state laws or your local hoa laws or whatever are much easier than than not. If you love your wife and you do the things that God has asked you to do to lead your home, then you'll be in subjection to the right people outside of your home and you'll lead where you need to lead. Right? If you, if I walk out of my house, I am leading my family. I'm going out there to make a living, to put food on the table. I'm going to lead that home. 
But you know what? There's times where I, I come to Pastor Cobb for advice, and if he gives me the, that advice, I'm going to be in subjection to that advice if it's biblical because he's the pastor of our church and he's, you know, my leader. There's times where I, you, you make those conscious choices. Who am I going to obey and who am I not? And then it also it can affect your prayer life. I mean, that's just a side note right there at the end of uh, 1 Peter. You're in Colossians 3, verse 18. Here we go again. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. You know, this is a great verse because I'm always talking about how the Bible talks about how women shouldn't be bitter. Because you see a lot of verses in Proverbs, especially about women, and you like most of the verses are, are geared towards like, you know, a quarrelsome woman and all that. I mean, all my life I've said that. And just the other day, you know, I, I was frustrated. We weren't fighting or anything. It was just I was just in a in a state of frustration, and I, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I was being very nice to anybody in the house. I wasn't being like a, a jerk or fighting, but. The Lord convicted me with this verse, and some, I, I think it just popped up on Facebook or something, and it was like, husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. And I thought, man, you know, that's a great verse because most people think that women just grow bitter, but you know what? It says men can grow bitter too towards their wives. And the Bible's telling me, don't be bitter against your wife. It says, love your wives. You know what I mean? I remember going, I said, honey, you know, is there anything? She didn't know where I was coming from. I was like, do you need anything? You know, she was feeling sick, I think, that day, and I was just... And I said, do you need me to bring you anything? Do you need a glass of water? Or can I cook dinner for you? I said, I'm pretty sure she was just like, what's going on? Because I had been you know, grumpy the rest of the day. But what it is is God convicts you. Are we going to obey God? Or am I just going to brush that off because I don't agree with it? You know, That's why we need to have a right view of, the, of God's hierarchy. Because that's the, kind of, that's the kind of thing that God's word does if you're willing to obey. You'll read a verse like that and you'll realize that you need to correct some things in your life. It says... Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and unto men, knowing that the Lord that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ." So we see this order, and it's interesting that if you get it right, that's why I didn't pick the government specifically, because if you get it right there, what, is, what are the next verses? He says, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Look, he's saying, look, if you're getting it right at home, it's, it's going to be natural. To just You say, well, I don't know that I have any masters. Look, maybe you don't call him a master today. You call him your boss you know, or your business partner or uh, whatever, whatever entity – outside of whatever entity outside of your home that you're dealing with. You know, we all have to deal with some form of authority. Uh, if you go, uh, go over to Genesis 2, and uh, I'm going to just read for you real quick First Timothy, and we'll start closing this out. But I'm, I wanted to cover all this because the Bible has a lot to say. And I mean, I didn't even touch, I, we didn't even go into Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. I mean, God talks a lot about how you should raise your families, how you need to write it upon the tables of your heart how God's word should be all over your home, how your children, you know, you should just be uh, teaching them in the, in the statutes and the laws of the Lord. But first, first Timothy 5.13 says, And with all they learn to be idle. You're in Genesis 2. I'm just reading First Timothy 5 for you real quick. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not to. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, Guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. You know, these are the kind of verses that really cause a lot of contention because the Bible is saying here specifically, how do you avoid uh, a busybody woman, a gossiper, a tattler? It says, look, if the younger women bear children, and it says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the, gu guide the house, Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. You know, one of the things, this stands out once you start raising a family. Because, yes, it's true that we carry the weight of the house as men. You know, we, we got to go out there and make decisions. We lead. If, if you believe biblically, you take on that role. And, 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 and we're built for that. We can handle that kind of stress. But you know what kind of stress we can't handle? We can't handle the stress of being around the children 24. And what I mean by that, I love my children. But I just don't have that ability to nurture them like a mother does. 
And, and one of the things that I hate about the feminist movement is the way that they downplay and condescend to a mother that's on 24-7. Because for me, feminists are a bunch of wimps because all they do is say, well, I can do anything a man can do. I can go to work from 8 to 5, and I can get in a career, and I can move up the ranks. Yeah, because you're a wimp. Because if you really wanted to be a tough woman, you'd have children. Because, I mean, I've been at home at times where my wife has a migraine. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, and one of the children's teething or they're sick, and they want to be up. And I'm like, honey, I'll help you. I love you. I'm going to help you. And I go into that room, and I'm like, hey, honey or son. And mama, mom. And no, no, mommy's sick. Mommy, mommy will be... Mama, if, what, ha, what is she? She's dragging into the room, half asleep, in pain, nauseous. And what does she has to do? She has to turn it on for the kids. How come feminists don't do that? You know, that, that's why God... And so she doesn't have time to be a busybody, to be a tattler. She doesn't have time to have the, the Satan, what does it say there? Uh, give a case, an occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. There's nothing reproachful to say about my wife or any wife like that that's raising their children because they're spending their time taking care of the kids. They're raising them. They're giving them the, that spiritual guidance. They're teaching them. They're admonishing them. It's a 24-7 uh, job. You know, people say, well, I don't want, uh, I remember a few years back I saw something. It was positive towards mothers. I remember seeing and it was like this, this skit or this video where they were interviewing people for this job and they're like, this job pays a lot of money. They're like, oh, this is great. I want to apply for it. They're like, but they're like, what are the job requirements? They're like, well, it's 24-7, you know, where you're going to get all kinds of calls in the morning and the evening. You don't get much sleep. And, and people were like, oh, well, I know it pays a lot. But they were rejecting the job, even though they were, they were qualified. And then eventually, you know, obviously the play is that this is the job of a mother. And that's true. You know, I wish society, at least I will, but I wish society would take that more seriously. And they would actually uh, give honor where honors due. You know, the job of a mother is a hard job. This is, I mean, that's not to be taken lightly. And nowadays, people just want to throw their kids into day, daycare. And, you know, I don't have any free time. And I wish I had just some time. Look, God has made a time for everything. When you have children, that is the time for children. You know, the Bible says there's a time to love and a time to hate. There's a time for everything. When you have children, there's a time for children. And sometimes when you have time for children, you don't have time for yourself. But guess what? One day they're going to leave, and there'll be plenty of time for yourself. You know, one of the things I see with my parents is now that all of us are gone out of the house, they have a lot of time for themselves. They have a lot of time to do whatever it is that they want to do. You know, and I think to myself, 20 years ago, they didn't have time even to, you know, just, you know, brush their teeth without us bugging them. Mom, can you sign this? Mom, I need that. Mom, can, mom, 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 mom. But let's go to Genesis 2, and we'll start closing this out. Genesis 2 Verse 21 and 22 says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was, t she was taken out of, the man out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. If you just turn your page over to uh, Genesis 3, verse 15, we see that after the fall, it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And you know, I used to think these were negative verses, but I just think if we just stop fighting the things that God has for us, it just makes your role that much easier. You know, because let's not just pick on the women. There's men today that want the role of the housekeeper. It's become more prominent where men stay home to try to guide the house while the woman goes to work. And let me tell you, that's a disaster for failure. I don't care how good this guy is. I don't care how nurturing he is. He is not a mother. You know, he didn't carry that baby for nine months. He has no idea. You know, and if the woman would just realize that her desire would be to her husband, you know what's one of the things that happens in, in, a, in a marriage, and I've heard, is that, you know, they kind of get bitter towards each other, and they're like, well, I, he's been so mean to me all my years, all life, and all this stuff. I, I don't want to cook for him anymore. 
Well, and then the other one's like, well, so-and-so doesn't cook for me anymore, so I just don't feel like being nice and loving. If one of them just changes and starts doing that, the other one will automatically, over time, want to reciprocate. You know, I mean, the challenges are there, but if you love your wife, guess what? Eventually, she's going to love you back. Because it's a choice. It's a conscious choice. Have you ever been, you know, I'm, I'm going on eight, eight years of marriage. I know some people in the room have been married longer. You know you've been to where you just, that fight you want to pick, I mean, you've got all the ammo. You, you're ready to pick that fight. And it goes both ways. But you remember what the Lord says. And if you just let things slow down, and if you love your wife like you love yourself, and if she's in subjection to you, you can overcome those fights so much easier. You know, I mean, I can count on one hand. I'm not talking, let's not take that wrong. I am not by any means of imagination saying I have a perfect marriage. That, that, that would be false. But I can count on one hand probably the major fights that we had. And one of the things that I think has helped our marriage is the fact that we both are in subjection to Christ. You know, and there have been times when my wife will bring something to me to the forefront with, a, uh, you know, with Scripture. And I'm just kind of left at, well, you know, if I obey the Lord, that's what I need to do. And vice versa, I'm like, honey, you know, I really wish that you would do this or we would change that. And it's because I was reading this in the Scripture and I think that our, we need to move in this direction. And even if she might not agree initially... Over time, I don't even, I've never had to force it. it. It's just been natural. Now, I'm not saying that it was easy. I don't, I don't know. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of things that I've done that have not been easy. But that's, that's the reason that we have a hierarchy. Because if, you, if we have a hierarchy, then we can do things for the honor and glory of Christ. You say, well, what's the whole point of this? Is it just to tell us that the Bible has all these rules in place? And No, the point of this is that when we understand how God has structured things in order, we understand how to better invest our time in life. Because we only get one life. There is no rehearsal. You know, one of the things that I, you catch yourself doing as you get closer, I'm going to be 40 next year, is you start trying to look back at the things that you've done and could have done. And one of the things that I've realized is that, you know, I've been wasting my time doing stuff like that. Because the Bible says, first of all, putting behind those things that are past, right? Reaching forward towards the mark towards the price of the high calling of Jesus Christ. That's number one. Number two is I think, oh, well, well why wasn't I born into a Christian home? Why, was, why did I get saved when I was 25? Well, for whatever reason that was, and I, I have another sermon for that another day, but one of the things is now that I am saved and I understand this hierarchy, then you can put your effort where it, most, and where it matters most. You know, if God's hierarchy, if Jesus was doing things to honor God's, the, to do the will of the Father and glorify Him, well then shouldn't it be my natural instinct to want to glorify the Father? So as a man, just outside of the church, I, that's why we soul win. That's why we read our Bibles. That's why we pray for people so we can glorify God. It's not to get some kind of recognition. But if I understand that it's my duty to raise my family and to teach them and to educate them, then I do it. Why? If, if I do it because I'm on a power trip, I'm going to lose that battle. But if I do it because God said so, then you know what, I'm going to win those battles where, you know, my wife will be better off spiritually. You know what, my children will come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and I'll make sure that they're with us in eternity. Those are the things that matter. Maybe our family members will notice what we're doing in our life. And they'll come, you know, my dad got saved earlier this year. That's something that I had just basically, I didn't know if it was ever going to happen. You know what, I, I believe that he got saved because I married a good, godly woman. I know that for a fact because he's seen the way that our marriage is and he knows that there's something to this thing called Christianity. Because before I got married, it was like contentious to the max. After I got married, he still was contentious, but it was never the same. And he's always telling me how I got, you know, this diamond and how she's, you know, I won the lottery. I didn't win the lottery. God gave her to me. It was a gift from God because... I'm saved by grace, and he's going to make sure that he never leaves me nor forsakes me. So he's going to provide a good help me because I, we understand the hierarchy. I'll close out with this. Ephesians 6, 1 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Look, we are to nurture and admonish our children. Not bring them. There's a difference between spanking your children and lashing out at your children. You know, one of the things that Mary, Sarah, and I have, you know, uh, instituted in our home is when we 
when we uh, when we execute our punishment, whether it's uh, you know talking to or spanking or anything, you just do it and move on. We never dwell on it. We don't write our children about it. We don't. There's no passive aggressiveness because that's a, that would make them angry. It says you provoke. You know one of the things that I'll give. You know, there's a lot of things you, you can always pick on any parent about all the things they did wrong. But my parents did one thing right: is they never dwelled on things. We got punished. Punishments were sometimes harsh, and then we moved on. And that was it. It was over. You learned your lesson. There's no need to beat a dead horse. Let's go ahead and uh, I'm just going to close out with Deuteronomy and Proverbs, and then we'll be done. But in Deuteronomy 5, 16 says, Honor thy father and thy mother, as the Lord God hath commanded thee, that thy days may be prolonged, that it may go well with thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Proverbs 1, 8 says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He that speak, spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth the times. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, if you learn these principles, and you apply them to your spiritual father, you know, it's going to make all the difference in the world. If we learn to obey in our homes, we're going to learn to obey God. And if we learn to obey God and we understand the hierarchy of things, then we'll know when to make decisions. Are we going to make the right decision all the time? Probably not. But I'm telling you, if we walk in the Spirit and we understand these basic principles of order, then we'll know where to make the right decisions because there will come a time where we're going to have to make those hard decisions. You know, I remember, and I'll close out with this, uh, I got swatted when I was in seventh grade. I rem- and I mean... I actually, I, my dad, my parents will attest to this if they ever listen. I was right. I was in the right for what I got swatted for. I remember a kid, uh, we had a troublemaker in the class. You know, every class has one troublemaker. And he was known as the troublemaker. And some other kid dropped a set of books. And the teacher immediately blamed the troublemaker kid. And I remember I stood up for this kid, and I was like, no, he didn't do that. And she's like, no, I know he did it. And so I called the teacher a liar. I remember I said, no, you're a liar. She was lying. She was picking on him. I know she was. Well, she immediately stopped the class. She picked me up. She took me to the principal's office. I waited there, and they swatted me. I got one or two swats. I don't remember. I was like, man. I remember, I, you know, you're a guy. You're holding in the tears. You know. And that was it. I don't know. Maybe it was different back then. They didn't call my parents. My parents had, they didn't know about it or anything like that. And I remember my parents had always taught me to just tell the truth and to be honest about things. And we were in the car and I told my parents, I said, look, I don't know how to tell you this because I knew what it meant for me. You know, if you got in trouble in school, that meant you were going to be in bigger trouble at home, right? I'm like, dad, mom, I got to tell you something. You know, here's the situation. Bottom line, I got in trouble. I got a SWAT. My parents almost got that lady fired. The reason they, they almost fired her wasn't for the SWAT. It was for the fact that they didn't call them you know, let them know that I was in trouble so that they could also come in and, and do the discipline. But what's, what was interesting is, why did I do that? I did that because they always disciplined us and taught us the right way to do things. You know, my parents always said, look, if, if you're in trouble, just own up to it. If you did something wrong, it's better for you to come forward sooner than later. You know, the truth is always going to come out. Over time, they had caught us in certain things where we try to hide the truth. And, and what, what has that done in, in my life now? Well, I know that there's going to come a time where we're going to face some harder consequences and we're going to have to stand for truth. And because we, I was able to stand for truth then, you say, well, that's a really dumb example. No, I don't think so. I think that's where it starts. If you can't tell the truth then, how are you going to tell the truth when you're older? If you can't stand strong then, how are you going to stand strong now? You know, I, I know that even though I got the SWAT, to this day I know I was right that I was right. One day we might be thrown in jail and the world will say we're wrong And if you know that you're right and you're right because God's word says you're right, then you'll stand for that truth. And you'll take that, and I'm talking about proverbial swat, in prison or in stripes or in death, but you'll do it because you learn the basic principles of God. And even though this might be a simple message, if you don't understand this, you can't even understand the the harder things in life. So anyways, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to just preach this message. Lord, thank you. That because of that, you know, even here in our church, we've been able to learn things. We've been able to reinstitute programs. We've been able to do other things. We're, we're uh, you know, putting efforts to grow where, where the main thing is the main thing. Thank you that 
you know, over time I've heard other preachers that talk about uh, soul winning, and even though I had a different soul winning method, you know, we've, we've now instituted soul winning door to door as a regular thing. Why? Not because other people did it, but because your word commands us to, because it instructs us to. You know, why do we come to church Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Wednesday? Uh, because you've instructed us to not forsaking, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. Why is it that even when, uh, you know, I might not agree or someone might not agree with certain things or vice versa, we don't always, because you, you've asked us to live peaceably, if at all possible, with all men. You know, why is it that we are able to sit through messages like the one that Pastor Cobb preached this morning? Because we know that it's his duty and responsibility to preach every word of God. Whether it makes us comfortable or not, doesn't matter. That's the word of God. So thank you, Lord, for instructing us, for teaching us that there's an order to things, that you're just not some a random God that just decides to do things at random like the world likes to teach, but that you're actually a loving God, that you're slow to anger, that you want everybody to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, that you want that eternity for them. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.